previously on Transformers. Bumblebee is right outside the med bay. He throws Sari through a ventilation duct, and Sari falls down into the cargo hold. But there shouldn't be a room above the cargo hold, because the cargo hold's on the top of the ship. I have found a solution to the arc paradox. Storyboard's back on 10 out of 10, best show I've ever seen. When asked about the best episode of Transformers Animated, a lot of fans point towards the season 3 opener, Transwarped. And it's no question why. Almost every single plot thread from the series gets thrown on the table here at full throttle. Every lingering question from season 2 gets answers in the most satisfying way imaginable. You get Sari coping with their newfound robotic abilities, Sumdak retaking ownership of his company, the fractured relationship between father and daughter, Blur desperately trying to find his way back to Cybertron, Megatron and Starscream lost in space post space bridge explosion, the origin story of Omega Supreme, shockwave in control of Cybertronian intelligence, the coordinated Decepticon uprisings to claim space bridges, and the culmination of the AllSpark Key storyline which had been slowly developing since season 1. There is a lot. A full 66 minutes of relentless adrenaline that by all means should be a cluttered mess, but against all odds works seamlessly. But what makes this feat all the more amazing is the origin behind the special. On page 399 of the Complete Allspark Almanac, the production of Transwarp is relayed. Quote, the story of the season 3 arc is a bit different from the earlier two. Production began on a 13 episode season starting with the episodes Homecoming and Upgrade but was halted when the Cartoon Network decided to kick off a season with a three-part movie. Since production had already begun on several episodes, they couldn't simply be discarded without wasting resources. On the other hand, the third episode of the season, Three's a Crowd, didn't fit thematically with the first two, chronicling the renewed threat of Headmaster and the upgrade of Sari to her older form. The solution was to pull up the season finale concept, a Megatron-controlled Omega Supreme, and use it for the third act of the movie, that would come to be called Transwarped. Uh, he also communicates this on the DVD commentary of Transwarped from the animated complete series DVD. And this this whole movie actually had an interesting genesis because if you remember, we had already started the scripts for season three, and then we got the word that they wanted to start the season with a movie. So we kind of had to go back and, and take the first two episodes um, that had already been written um, maybe even recorded, I can't remember. Um, and then weave in the whole Ratchet um, Omega Supreme yeah. flashback yeah. story. And it actually um, worked pretty well, even though it was sort of Frankenstein together. Um, this section, the, uh, the Headmaster story, was written by Michael Ryan, who wrote quite a number of episodes for us, uh, some of the best ones in the series. Um, and then the second part was written by Marsha Griffin, so she's the one that uh, deals with the, the sorry upgrade. Um, and then the, the Ratchet story and the... Uh, Spoilers, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you watched the episode first and then you went back to listen oh, to the okay. commentary. All right, that's, that's... At least that's how I would do it. I'm, I'm weird that way. Uh, but then the, the, uh, the remainder, the, the, the Ratchet stuff and the, and the big climax of the end was me. So. This completely changes the understanding of this episode, and I took it upon myself to reverse engineer the episodes into their original components. To do this, we'll look at every single scene of the special as a puzzle piece. This is going to be a bit lengthy and expository, but here are all of the pieces of this puzzle. Transwarped Part 1 Decepticon Team Char takes a space bridge and reports to Shockwave at the space bridge Nexus, who tells them that Megatron went radio silent. Megatron and Starscream bicker in space, and Omega Supreme transwarps next to them. Sumdak explains finding the liquid metal body in his lab. Sari is still pretty mad. Sumdak kicks Powell and Masterson out of Sumdak Tower. Robot Sari decides to live with the Autobots. At the Earth plant, Ratchet probes Sari and deduces that she's basically part human and part Cybertronian. Ratchet flashes back to Cybertron post-thrill of the hunt, where he's introduced to RC in her comatose state. Bumblebee and Bulkhead decide to head to the mines to salvage parts and contact Cybertron. Blur escapes from Skywarp and Thundercracker and races back to Cybertron. Headmaster finds his Headmaster unit in the mine with a large winged accessory attached to it. Megatron and Starscream force entry, and Megatron manipulates Omega Supreme into relocating them to Cybertron. Bumblebee finds a plasma dynamic thruster, which randomly transwarps him away. 
Headmaster attacks Bulkhead. So this is one scene, but we're gonna split it into two, and you'll see why later. Prowl stalks Sumback to learn about Sari's origin. Optimus urges Sari to talk to her father, but she doesn't listen. Ratchet manages to extract RC's activation codes for Omega Supreme, and he's introduced to Project Omega. Optimus tells Ratchet that there's no word from Bumblebee or Bulkhead. Optimus manipulates a meeting between Sari's and Sumback at Burgerbot. However, Headmaster bugs the line and arrives to attack them. Transwarped Part 2 Optimus fights and defeats Headmaster, and Sari makes up with Professor Sumdak. Prowl reveals his findings. Sari came from Protoform. Ratchet informs Optimus that Bumblebee's missing and Bulkhead's injured. Bumblebee randomly transwarps through space. Omega Supreme deactivates and Megatron opts to take control of him himself. Blur returns to Cybertron, but is killed by a desperate shockwave. Sari uses her key to patch up Bulkhead much to Ratchet chagrin. Ratchet flashes back to being partnered with Omega Supreme as a mentor. Bulkhead detects Bumblebee's energy signature and tries to pinpoint it. Omega Supreme is attacked by Rock Lords and teleports away to safety. Bumblebee then appears and is swallowed by a Rock Lord. Bulkhead draws the Rock Lord to Earth and he goes on a rampage. The Autobot team battles him and Ratchet unsheathes his EMP generator. Sorry wants to help, but is denied. Sari then upgrades herself. Megatron finally uses Starscream's head to hotwire Omega Supreme. Sari defeats the Rock Lord, but goes out of control and on a rampage. Bumblebee tries to stop her, but gets stabbed. Transwarped, Part 3. Ratchet struggles to repair the injured Bumblebee. Ratchet flashes back to putting the dying Omega Supreme in a modified stasis. Sari's rampage is relentless, even after removing the key from her. Ratchet winds up having to use his EMP on her. Shockwave returns to the Metroplex and disposes a blur. He makes contact with Megatron, and Megatron tells him to call off the invasion. Team Char retreats from the space bridge, much to the surprise of the Elite Guard. Sumback arrives at the Earth base, and Optimus opts to give him time with his daughter. Outside, Omegatron Supreme transforms to Earth and attacks the Autobots. Prowl and Optimus force entry, and Prowl taps into Omega Supreme's processor. There's a lengthy battle for his control, with Starscream getting involved, but ultimately Ratchet talks to him and takes control emotionally. An EMP blast deactivates Omega Supreme again, and a plasma dynamic thruster sends him randomly transwarping around the galaxy. Sari wakes up and apologizes, saying Ratchet was right. Bulkhead points out they still have to contact Cybertron. On Cybertron, Ultra Magnus begins to suspect a double agent and orders Sentinel and Jazz to head to Earth. Omega Supreme transwarps randomly, out of control. Wow, that was a lot. Now, let's begin to split it up into its three components. Homecoming, Upgrade, and the added Omega Supreme storyline. So, it, it's simple for the most part. Everything that involves Headmaster falls into Homecoming. Everything that features Sari's Upgrade falls into Upgrade. Everything that features Omega Supreme falls into the third added storyline. For time and pacing's sake, I'm not gonna list through everything again. That'd be a, a waste of time, but what I'll do now is try to figure out where all the leftover pieces go, and then I'll restate the final episodes at the end. Bumblebee and Bulkhead are at the mines, so the scene where they decide to go to the mines must happen in Homecoming. Now, Transformers Animated was a very episodic show by nature. Objects, locations, and characters featured in one episode tended to only be in that one episode, and not the others immediately near it. So based on that, we can make some deductions about where the remaining clips go. Since Sumdeck explains the Protoform origin in Homecoming, I think that Prowl's investigation of the Protoform take place in Homecoming. This also makes sense because the scene where Prowl reveals his findings is the same scene which sees Sari and Sumdak have a resolution to their arc of the episode. The next order of business is determining where all the Cybertron segments go, involving the Space Bridge, the Space Bridge Nexus, and Metroplex. These don't fit into either of the two episode descriptions, and the Omega Supreme story is pretty full. Luckily, there are answers. The Complete Allspark Almanac shows the first page of the script for Transwarp Part 1, formerly Homecoming, and reveals that it's written by Michael Ryan. The opening scene was definitely part of Homecoming. Given the aforementioned episodic nature, I feel that any scene involving Shockwave, the Space Bridge Nexus, or Team Char were a part of the same episode. This includes the death of Blur and Shockwave's conference with Megatron. I also think that the closing scene with the council meeting was part of Homecoming. Ultra Magnus and Jazz both appeared and spoke during the Team Char stuff, and Sentinel had lines that got cut. So since they talk here again, I think it's really likely that this was part of Homecoming, because they wouldn't have just appeared for one scene in one line in Upgrade. Now is where things get tricky. All of the remaining scenes involve Bumblebee transwarping around the galaxy. 
Cue the commentary. Originally, the the subplot of Bumblebee jumping through the galaxy was was part of another episode. I think it was part of the the Three's a Crowd episode, oh, which right. Rich Fogel wrote. So I, I, Rich is not credited in this episode, but I'm, I'm going to right a wrong and say that Rich <laughs> did contribute some of the story. Mm. So. But then we ended up having to put that whole other subplot in Three's a Crowd where they defeat Lugnut and then they can't move him. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm glad you remember all of that stuff, man. That's, uh... That's really great. Yeah. <laughs> Bumblebee's transwarp tour of the galaxy was supposed to happen in Three's a Crowd. And on the surface, this makes sense. Both involved the plasma dynamic thruster, meaning this was originally intended to be a one-off device rather than one of the cruxes of the third season. It also makes sense, seeing as the Lugna stuff is very disjointed from the rest of the episode. It's really funny though, compared to Sorry No One's Home, where the Blitzwing B-plot just felt like egregious time padding, this is amazing. So remove all that. Where on earth does Bumblebee's Transwarp Tour of the Galaxy fit into Three's a Crowd? To start, let's examine the biggest problem on the table, the Rock Lord. I know a lot of people were thinking of Rock Lords because they're transforming rock monsters, but I don't think we were really looking no, at that. I don't think so. I think it's just rock monster was yeah. a re point of reference. Or technically not a rock lord, whatever. In Transwarp Part 2, Bulkhead bringing a rock lord to Earth is what sends Sari into action to upgrade herself. So it's hard to imagine the rock lord being omitted from that story. The love that scenes from Three's a Crowd only add up to be about 3 minutes and 30 seconds, and the rock lord battle is way too long. There's no way that could have fit into Three's a Crowd. So how exactly does this work? At this point, I have no clue. There's nothing I can find which sheds any light on this. So at this point, I'm reduced to guessing. Here's my theory. The Rock Lord was part of Upgrade, and Bumblebee getting swallowed by the Rock Lord was an edit to the script made by Eisenberg. The Retrieval Beacon Generator was to be introduced in Upgrade, and Bulkhead would have been attempting to lock onto Omega Supreme, However, he brings the Rock Lord down by accident without Bumblebee in sight. In Three's a Crowd, Bumblebee is with the other Autobots carrying the Plasma Dynamic Thruster. He winds up accidentally teleporting himself across the galaxy. Optimus, Prowl, and Ratchet then have to figure out how to get him back. This should be about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Let's try to figure out the original timeline of Three's a Crowd. Keep in mind that Eisenberg might have changed some of the locations from these scenes or transferred dialogue from character to character in the edit after taking out the Bumblebee subplot. Sumdak and Bulkhead are working in Sumdak Tower on the Space Bridge. The other Autobots pursue Lugnet, who attacks them. Scratch this, replace this with Bumblebee, Optimus, Prowl, and Ratchet are combing around the mines when Bumblebee teleports away. A structural integrity accident sends a forklift, a headmaster unit, and an all-spark fragment plummeting to the bottom of Sumdak Tower. Bulkhead recruits Mixmaster and Scrapper's help in repairing it. However, Dirt Boss forms and quickly makes it known that he's the boss. The Autobots are too busy battling Lugnut to help. Cut this and replace it with a helpless Bumblebee transwarping around space. Dirt Boss asserts dominance and turns Scrapper and Mix against the city. Sumdak comes in, and in order to protect his cover, Bulkhead makes Sumdak genuinely afraid of him. It seems like when Rich Fogel writes scripts, Sumdak is way more finicky and panicked. I think that him becoming afraid of Bulkhead is a little out of character, but also really shows how his trauma from reactivating Megatron is affecting him. Anyways, the Constructicons steal oil from Detroit. The Autobots put stasis cuffs on Lugnut, but can't move him. Scratch this. Ratchet, rather than Bulkhead, pinpoints Bumblebee's energy signature and manages to return him to Earth. Sumdak arrives with a plasma dynamic thruster and begs for forgiveness. None of the dialogue in this scene indicates the thruster, so I think that this was not originally in the script. There was only one plasma dynamic thruster in the episode, and it's the one that Bumblebee has. So, no thruster in Sumdak's hands. Bulkhead finally gives up hope on the Constructicons and turns on them, but they get physically stuck together. Bulkhead's dragged to the oil depository and tries to call Prime for backup. The Autobots abandon Lugnut and come to help. Rather than the crater, I'm assuming that they're leaving the mines, in the original script. They arrive, there's a fight, the oil ignites, Bulkhead uses the plasma dynamic thruster, given to him by Bumblebee rather than Sumdak. Oh no! I'm gonna transwarp again! The plasma dynamic thruster! Great idea! I think I can reprogram it for a shorter distance. To teleport it out of Detroit and next to Dinobot Island. Dinobot Island explodes a lot. <laughs> the 
This leaves two scenes left over. Ratchet informs Optimus that Bumblebee's missing and Bulkhead's injured, and Bumblebee then appears and is swallowed by a rock lord. It's my belief that both of these scenes were only added to bridge the episodes together and were not part of any of the original scripts. And with that, we have assembled Homecoming and Upgrade. There's a few small blemishes I'm now gonna clear up. At the end of Transwarp Part 3, Bulkhead says, Good thing, cause you and me still gotta figure out how we're gonna get word back to Cybertron. As it happens, there wasn't any Elite Guard or Cybertron stuff featured in Upgrade, so this line was either supposed to be said during the end of Homecoming to segue into the Ultra Magnus scene, or added completely. I think the Upgrade would have ended with, Guess this old bot isn't so obsolete after all. Two, when Shockwave speaks to Megatron in Transwarp Part 3, Megatron's in Omega Supreme. Let's say he's not. He's floating in space, and I know that internal comms wouldn't allow him to talk to someone so far out of range, but... I'm sure there's some story plot device they would have pulled, it's plausible. Either Megatron finds somewhere to talk to Shockwave, or he's just in space. It is Megatron's only scene in the episode. Or, the conversation with Megatron was added, post-transwarped. Originally, it was Shockwave taking initiative in and of himself to call off the Space Bridge invasion, and Megatron was not going to appear in Homecoming. 3. Ratchet wants to run a scan on Sari, and Sari's like, NO! No way am I letting you slice me open! I mean, I'm sure you were a great metabot. In your time. Way back when. This scene I think only exists to transwarp into Ratchet's flashback, and it was not a part of Homecoming or Upgrade. So, finally, we've pieced them together, we can relay Homecoming and Upgrade. Homecoming by Michael Ryan. Decepticon Team Char takes a space bridge and reports to Shockwave at the space bridge Nexus, who tells them that Megatron went radio silent. Sumdak explains finding the liquid metal body in his lab. Sari is still pretty mad. Sumdak kicks Powell and Masterson out of Sumdak Tower. Robot Sari decides to live with the Autobots. Blur escapes from Skywarp and Thundercracker and races back to Cybertron. At the Earth plant, Ratchet probes Sari and deduces that she's basically part human and part Cybertronian. Bumblebee and Bulkhead decide to head to the mines to salvage parts and contact Cybertron. Headmaster finds his Headmaster unit in the mine with a large winged accessory attached to it. Blur returns to Cybertron but is killed by a desperate shockwave. Bulkhead and Bumblebee scavenge the mines. Headmaster attacks Bulkhead and Bumblebee. Prowl stalks Sumdak to learn about Sari's origin. Optimus manipulates a meeting between Sari's and Sumdak at Burgerbot. However, Headmaster bugs the line and arrives to attack them. Optimus fights and defeats Headmaster, and Sari makes up with Professor Sumdak. Shockwave returns to the Metroplex and disposes of Blur. He makes contact with Megatron, and Megatron tells him to call off the invasion. Team Char retreats from the Space Bridge, much to the surprise of the Elite Guard. Prowl reveals his findings. Sari came from Protoform. On Cybertron, Ultra Magnus begins to suspect a double agent, and orders Sentinel and Jazz to head to Earth. This directly acknowledges a lot of where a bridge too close left off, with Blur crushed by Shockwave and the Elite Guard opting to initiate communication with Optimus Prime's team, leading into Where Is Thy Sting. It's the story of mending the relationship between Sari and her father, and also an introduction to the mystery of Sari's origin. Upgrade by Marsha Griffin. Sari uses her key to patch up Bulkhead, much to Ratchet chagrin. Bulkhead detects Bumblebee's energy signature and tries to pinpoint it. Bumblebee draws the Rock Lord to Earth and he goes on a rampage. The Autobot team battles him and Ratchet unsheathes his EMP generator. Sari wants to help, but is denied. Sari then upgrades herself. Sari defeats the Rock Lord, but goes out of control and on a rampage. Bumblebee tries to stop her, but gets stabbed. Ratchet struggles to repair the injured Bumblebee. Sari's rampage is relentless, even after removing the key from her. Ratchet winds up having to use his EMP on her. Sumback arrives at the Earth base, and Optimus opts to give him time with his daughter. Sari wakes up and apologizes, saying Ratchet was right. Bulkhead points out they still have to contact Cybertron. The mystery and Cybertronian society are not in play. Rather, this episode sees Sari discontent with how the Autobots don't trust her. It also introduces an attempt to locate Omega Supreme, a plot thread which, even though it was scrapped, would be picked up in This Is Why I Hate Machines. It's a story of old school versus new school that revolves around Sari and Ratchet as they both come to accept the benefits of the other's way of life. Just for fun, we'll look at the Abed Omega Supreme storyline. Keep in mind, this was never intended to be an episode in and of itself, so it doesn't flow organically from scene to scene. 
Megatron and Starscream bicker in space, and Omega Supreme transwarps next to them. Ratchet flashes back to Cybertron post-thrill of the hunt, where he's introduced to RC in her comatose state. Megatron and Starscream force entry, and Megatron manipulates Omega Supreme into relocating them to Cybertron. Ratchet manages to extract RC's activation codes for Omega Supreme, and he's introduced to Project Omega. Omega Supreme deactivates, and Megatron opts to take control of him himself. Ratchet flashes back to being partnered with Omega Supreme as a mentor. Omega Supreme is attacked by Rock Lords and teleports away to safety. Megatron finally uses Starscream's head to hotwire Omega Supreme. Ratchet flashes back to putting the dying Omega Supreme in a modified stasis. Outside, Omegatron Supreme transwarps to Earth and attacks the Autobots. Prowl and Optimus force entry and Prowl taps into Omega Supreme's processor. There's a lengthy battle for his control, with Starscream getting involved, but ultimately Ratchet talks to him and takes control emotionally. An EMP blast deactivates Omega Supreme again, and a plasma dynamic thruster Simpson randomly transwarping around the galaxy. But this was always something that I, uh, when we first introduced Omega Supreme in season two, I had it in the back of my head that this was his backstory, but I figured we're never going <laughs> right. to actually tell this story. But you know, my my sense of is he was if the atom bomb had a personality, mm -hmm. that yeah. would be this guy, and just feeling the weight of all he had done. Uh, and then, shockingly, we, we managed to do it. Yeah. There we go. Based on rational deductions and a whole lot of guesstimations, we've managed to put together the original stories of Homecoming and Upgrade best we could with the information we have. It's remarkable for such a messy, Frankensteining together of episode stories which weren't intended to function in unison, Transwarp winds up being one of the highlights of Transformers Animated despite all the studio meddling. It speaks to the talent of Marty Eisenberg that he was able to bind these episodes together in such a powerful way. And who knows, I could be completely wrong about all of this. I'm sure I'm wrong about a ton of stuff. Putting this out here, there's more people, more brains, hopefully you can help piece this together. Wait, I was wrong about everything. I take it back, all of the Cybertron and Blur stuff happens in Upgrade, not Homecoming because the Allspark Almanac shows multiple deleted scenes from Homecoming. The first page of the script that I showed you earlier was actually clearly written post the transwarped upgrade of the episodes, which means they may have just as well been part of Upgrade as part of Homecoming. So considering the fact that Homecoming as we have it comes in at 24 minutes, and Upgrade comes in at 19 minutes, and all of the Blur and Cybertron stuff adds up to be about 5 minutes, there's definitely not more room in Homecoming, and there's a massive empty space in Upgrade. So. Ignore the entire last 22 minutes of your life. It was all wrong. Elevating Stryka into the... I was shocked that anyone wanted to bring back a Beast Machines character. <laughs> <Yeah. so that's... laughs> Some of us liked it, Marty. <laughs>